So I was uh, having a discussion with some really intelligent people uh, recently, um, some of whom are not in medicine, though. And um, it occurred to me during that discussion that one of the challenges of medicine that maybe those of us inside understand and appreciate is, um, is worth explaining. Uh, and it comes down to basically the idea of certainty and how we test um, ideas, interventions, hypotheses. And, and it comes down to this idea of what has become arguably the most important cornerstone of medicine 2.0, which is the idea of the randomized control trial. Um, so in the course of this discussion, people were asking about various interventions. Hey, does, you know, does this thing help you live longer? What about this thing? What about this thing? And in everything that they asked, it was an unanswerable question. Um, and so I kind of started jotting down some notes about what is required for an RCT to work. And when you go through these five things, and by the way, these are just the five things I wrote down. If I thought about this a lot more, there's probably more requirements. Um, you realize very few interventions will fit into these buckets. So the five things I wrote down are, first of all, you can randomize, okay? So there are certain things you just can't randomize people to. It's not ethical, right? We can't do a study that says, um, does smoking shorten your life? Or does smoking increase your risk of something that's not obvious? So, if, you know, for example, we can't, you know, we know smoking, of course, short, uh, shortens your life and increases your risk of many things. But let's just assume we wanted to know if it impacted Alzheimer's disease. It wouldn't be ethical to do it. Just like it's not ethical to do a study about what happens if you exercise versus not exercise over a very long period of time. Second, can you blind Again, we take this for granted, but blinding is an essential part of these studies. Now, in an ideal world, you want to be able to blind both the subjects and the investigator. But at a minimum, you need to be able to blind the subjects for this to really be effective. Uh, but of course, because the investigators can introduce their own bias unknowingly or knowingly, in an ideal world, you want to be able to blind doubly. So you hear this term, doubly blinded randomized control trial. Number three. This one sucks, but it's true. The intervention needs to be simple. In fact, in an ideal world, the intervention not only needs to be simple, but it needs to be binary. It needs to be digital. It needs to be zero, one, on, off, right? So um, again, what is the perfect example of this? The perfect example of this is a pill, where everybody gets a pill. Some people just get a placebo. Some people get an active pill. Everybody's taking the pill, so you're either getting the zero or the one. Again, it's blindable to both the person who takes the pill uh, and the person who gives the pill. But think of all the things where the intervention is not binary. Nutrition, exercise, sleep, supplements, saunas, all of these things, they're all analog. Little bit more, little bit less, how much, how hot, how long, very challenging. Number four. You need to be able to get the answer in a short period of time. What do I mean by short period of time? Well, I would say that if you truly look at an RCT lasting more than four or five years, you're looking at a very long RCT. Um, it's not that it's not possible, but boy, it becomes cost prohibitive. Um, so the longest randomized control trials have to be able to answer a question within a few years. And in an ideal world, a lot less. So if you look at early stage drug trials, they basically have to have biomarkers because you at least have to get your answer in phase one and phase two using biomarkers and not necessarily hard outcomes. Which gets to number five. You have to have objective outcomes that are ideally uh, hard. Uh, so a hard outcome would be mortality. That would be the ultimate hard outcome. Does intervention X alter the course of a person's life? Does it increase the duration of a person's life? Does it alter the course of a disease? So in cardiovascular disease, we often look at what's called MACE, major adverse cardiac events. And this would be a heart attack, a stroke, cardiac death, uh, you know, re uh, the need for revascularization, something like that. So if you put all of these together, you realize, boy, there's a lot that can't be done. In fact, you could, you could address all one, two, three, and five, but not four, if you're trying to do a study for primary prevention in low-risk individuals. Right? So if you took the perfect intervention, the perfect pill, the perfect drug, and you said, I believe this is going to delay the onset of cardiovascular death, and we want to test this in 30-year-olds, 
it's not going to work. Why? Because you're going to have to wait 30 or 40 years to get your answer. It's simply impossible. So I say all of this not to suggest that the randomized control trial is not valuable. It is imperative. I simply say it to argue that we have to be able to go beyond randomized control trials in humans that are at the gold standard if we want to get past medicine 2.0. And one of the ideas in medicine 3.0 is the idea that we have to be able to rely on not just evidence-based medicine, which falls into this, but also evidence-informed medicine. We have to be able to extrapolate intelligently from what we know from our CTs. We have to be able to also maybe include what we've learned in cross-species experiments. We have to be able to impute intelligently what we gather from biomarkers or indications around specific diseases and what we know about that disease relative to all-cause mortality. So for example, we might look at an intervention that lowers ApoB significantly and say, well, you know, is that a decent enough proxy for the fact that this might also reduce cardiovascular mortality? Um, when people ask me, what are you most hopeful for in the next decade of biomedical research? I think there were many things, so I couldn't come up with one, but one that often comes to my mind is far better biomarkers that tell us about the hallmarks of aging. So when we think about the cellular hallmarks of aging, when we think about the cellular markers of what it means to age, and I'm not gonna go through all of them here, um, we don't have great biomarkers for those things. And that's largely thwarted our ability to test molecules that may or may not be geroprotective. So um, anyway, a little bit of a rambling on the limitations of the randomized control trial. It's obviously a beautiful baby. We don't want to throw it out with a bunch of bathwater, but we should acknowledge that we need a lot more babies if we're going to um, try to get a better handle on some of the age-related illnesses. I hope that analogy about babies and bathwater was even quasi-coherent.